Hello, everyone. Welcome to the County of Brant. On behalf of my elected council, I'd like to welcome you for those that don't live here. I'm sure that some of you have lived here and moved on. May have been a mistake. We're quite a popular place to live right now. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's nice that I'm able to do this today. Uh, for those of you that don't know who I am, I'm David Bailey and I'm the mayor of the County of Brant. And I've been asked to sort of MC today's um, event. And I'm very happy to do it because I've known the Gockles all my life. Uh, in fact, um, probably my father, I believe, had something to do with the hiring of Mr. Gockle back in the day. And my mother was a very good friend of Helen Gockle, who uh, passed away very early in life. And she was a, a wonderful lady. I remember her well. And she was part of the, uh, the concession booth ladies who were, uh, you know, Mrs. Simpson and Mrs. Uh, Bansicle and Mrs. Cornell, my mom, a few other people. And uh, back then at the arena, it was a very different place. Um, it was a very uh, community-minded place at a grassroots level. We, we had just gone through raising all the money to build this place, and we were all doing paper drives and walkathons and roller after it was built, we did roll-a-thons to raise money, raise money to keep the lights on and to sustain the place. And so this arena, this arena is a very special arena because it was built by us. And when I say us, I mean my generation, who I see a lot of you here today. Um, we actually did the work and raised the money to build this. And it's a very different way of built, having an arena uh, instead of going to the province or going to the feds for money to fund something like this or going to the county or to the municipality and just getting a big check and just building an arena. Um, this was built because we needed it, because we were tired of driving through St. George on the way to Linden, which was a much too cold arena, uh, <laughs> or to go to Air, which was just as cold as Linden. So we needed our own arena, so we did something about it and we, we built this. And we built it off the backs of ourselves and off the generation of our parents. So uh, I would just like to remember Helen because without Helen, obviously all of you people wouldn't be here. And she wasn't just a, a nice lady, she was a very nice lady, she was a very quiet lady. And I see it when I see Kathy and when I see Patty, uh, the mannerisms of um, what, what she brought to the family, the Gawkle family. So I just didn't want to miss that opportunity. And of course, Earl, uh, we all knew Earl and how he worked and how he walked. I can still see him walking, he walked a certain way. Um, but what you maybe don't know is that obviously I know all of the goggles and I went to school with Kathy, now Kate. Uh, but what you don't know is when, when Mrs. Gockle died, when, when Helen died, I had a very special relationship with Patty. And that was in 1975 that her and I had a very special relationship. And I was going to school in Holland at the time. And she actually wrote me a letter every second day for 14 months. I, because back then, back then in 1975, when I was going to school in Holland, uh, there was no internet, there was no nothing. We could only call home once every six weeks. And, uh, and, and Patty wrote me every day, every day or every second day. And I would go to the mailbox and there'd be letters from her. And of course, there's nothing to say about St. George every day. So she would send me, she would send me things and we, we just had a very, very special relationship, and I'm sorry that she couldn't be with us today. I was really, really hoping to see her, but uh, she's somewhere else. And in scanning, in scanning the room, I certainly can tell who the Gockles are and who the Gockles aren't. You all sort of look the same. You're very much like Baileys, actually. Uh, you can tell who the Baileys are and who the Baileys aren't. But, but um, and because this is going to be the Gockle family, um, arena or, or um, building. I also want to tell you that Al Gockel, who is represented by Debbie and his daughter, daughters, was my father's partner uh, in, in a race car, number 41, and then eventually turned to number 21. And Al Gockel and uh, my dad were partners for many, many years with Phil Plant near the end for the second car. So I spent a lot of time uh, with Al and Debbie. Of course, I knew Debbie before she married Al when she was terrorizing Br Branchton <laughs> and, uh, and then married Elsa and I've known Ken I, and of course I know Ken and Rick and, and the rest of you too. So I mean, I'm only saying that because it's very unusual that you would have a mayor that could go back so far 
when you're recognizing a family so big and so great. And uh, I just, after this generation, after our generation, people won't remember uh, Helen and Earl the way we do. We lived it, we knew them. We're not just hearing stories about them. We, we actually uh, lived, we know that they lived on Queen Street, we lived on Beverly, so the bond is there and the county is very happy to do this for you. Um, it's, not, it's not usual that we acknowledge one family so many times in so many ways. So it speaks, um, it speaks to the integrity of you people and I'm, I'm glad that you were part of the history of South Dumfries, the building of the, of the arena, and now onward into the future of the County of Brant. So with that being said, I'm going to call on Wilm Balma, who is our member of parliament. I can almost call him the late great because he came in at the very end. I'm very well, sir. Welcome. Uh, so good to be here. I apologize. I talk too much, and Friday mornings is when I try to see a few patients yet to try to keep my optometry license up. Um, and uh, I, I do talk too much, solving people's problems. But uh, thank you for making me so welcome and for, for being here. It is an honor to be here. It's interesting. This job as MPP and in fact as, as ward councillor here before, we live in an incredible community. And we live in an incredible community because there have been incredible people that have lived here before us, that have built this, that make these things happen. And all we do is stand on their shoulders. And then we have to be driven by the, the desire to do what they did and to build on what they have built. You know, and you could say, oh, you know, these, these, these people were just employees for the community, they just worked for the community, but, but they weren't. In fact, I, I saw a county employee today for an eye exam and the dedication that our staff have to build our community is, is stunning. And I see a couple of them sitting back there and they serve the community every single way. In fact, this morning we were at a, uh, a fire call, because I'm still a volunteer firefighter, and someone passed away. And there are people there who work for the County of Brant, but they still got up at 4.30 this morning because their pagers went off and served this community. And so it is so good to be able to honor those people that have done so much for us who have come before. So that when our children ask us and they say, who was that guy? Who was that? And we put up these markers and we celebrate these lives. And we have to, because I'm 50. Um, there's lots of people here older than I am. We have to remember them. We have to put up these markers in our communities so that people can ask and people can learn those stories and people can see what kind of people we can all be because the youth, honestly, they're raring to go. I know we always want to write off young people, but when I look around at the people that have volunteered at Apple Fest and all the young people that have showed up to do those things, they are young. They are our future. And we get to put up these guideposts for them by renaming buildings in order to tell those stories about who has gone before and what we can all do in being like they were to make this community even better. And so it is an honor to be here today. It is an honor to celebrate with the family um, and friends of the Gockel family. And it is a good thing that we take this time and make these things happen. Again, thank you for having me. And again, I apologize for being late, but it's just an absolute pleasure to be here with you all today. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I have shoes that are 50. Um, because, <laughs> that's sad but true. Um, because, because it's an election year and we're got, we have an election just around the corner, it's my duty to introduce candidates that are running for this election. I'd like to acknowledge Janine Forbes, who's running as councillor in Ward 1. I would like to also uh, mention Lucas, right over there. He's running for Ward 2 councillor in Paris. 
And we have Mr. Swanson here who's running against me for mayor. Uh, right there, David Swanson. And I don't think there's anyone else. Oh, there is. There's Jennifer Kyle, who's also running for Ward, ward 1 in, uh, in the Glen in St. George and Harrisburg, Ward 1. Anybody else? Seeing none. The next person that's going to speak is going to be John Wheat. John Wheat's a very special kind of a guy, uh, quite a character. Um, Mr. Wheat wasn't going to run, he said, in this election, and he decided to, and I'm glad that he did. And um, he had a little checklist, and he had to get this checklist going because he didn't know if he was going to run or not. So he wanted to get a stop sign down on Victor Boulevard, and he kind of snuck that through. And he wanted to do a couple of other things. He got that done. But this was one of the things that he had to get done before, just in case he decided not to run, or just, because, just in case the hip didn't take, or the knee didn't take, or whatever he had done last didn't take. But he's, he's come out of all of that surgery very well, but the one thing he did want to do before he retired, if he was going to retire, and we're glad that he's not, was to get this done. So this is all on John, the timing is all on John. Uh, the county certainly um, supported him, council supported him, but if not for John Wheat, this wouldn't be happening, and you have to give shout outs where they belong. And uh, Councillor Wheat, if you'd like to come up now and speak, please. First of all, thanks for the kind words, David. I really don't need a microphone. Um, it's a proud day for me. A few years ago, um, I spearheaded to honor our family, the Nixon family, who brought a lot of political life here to this community, and we <clears throat> renamed part of Highway 5 Nixon Way. I'm gonna go back a little bit, David, and help you out. I was part of the fundraising it started here, and it started with the Lions Club, and I want the Lions members that are here to stand up, because it was your founding members, and there's <laughs> Teddy Roberts. And there's a gentleman that I got to work with, I was a young mouth, and the Lions Club did the fundraising, and I was partnered with a chap named Doug Brown. <coughs> who started H.D. Brown Enterprises. And we knocked on doors asking for contributions, $52 a year. Four times a year, you contributed $13 to help raise money to build this place. So I want to acknowledge the Lions Club, and I'm gonna acknowledge them again later on when I get, get, before I get done talking. But I wanna talk about Earl, the Gockel family. Uh, Earl wasn't just our arena manager. And Diane Cooper, sitting way at the back, inconspicuously, was quite involved with Earl and our first hydroelectric commission here in St. George, and that was before we had an arena. The hydroelectric commission. And Earl Gockel was a founding member of that. And then he went on, later on, to sit on the board of directors for Brant County Power, which we had up until a couple years ago when Brant County was sold to that electrical company north of us in Cambridge. Uh, so Earl was a community person before he was an arena manager. But he was working at Brantford. His wife had passed away and he'd been laid off and this building was under construction, and Earl kept an eye on it every day he was here, making sure things were getting done right. And then he became our arena manager. And boy, was he ever an arena manager. Inconspicuous, quiet, shy, unassuming, and they passed th those traits on to his son, Ken. But he incorporated some of the young brats here in town, and one of them sitting out right out here to my left, Mark Loeb. Mark, would you stand up? <laughs> because Mark at the time, and you will recall, Mark, all the trouble you used to cause in town. <laughs> the Earl Gockel thought, I'm going to hire that kid. And look at him today, low plumbing and heating. He's not a little brat in town anymore but Earl Gockel took him under his wing. 
And the only bad thing I can remember about Mark after he became an employee, was Earl Gockel just didn't give directions, he did the work too. And he was down on his hands and knees, painting trim around the outside of a room. And Loby came in and, unknown to Earl, painted the bottom of Earl's shoes. <laughs> and you remember that, don't you, Mark? <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing you were an employee or you would have never been allowed in the building again. <laughs> but when Earl got up to go for a walk, his footprints were everywhere. It's just like in the hospital today when you go to the D-Wing, you've got to have something done, follow the footprints. So, Lobi, I attribute to that, and I think when they first got going here, some of the early employees, Dean Morrison, who we just lost not too long ago, Jimmy Roseborough, who fought death off, but Jimmy Roseborough was an original. And some of the boys that he took under his wing and gave them a job and gave them guidance. I'll never forget those days for Earl. Earl Gockel was an icon in this town, not just an arena manager. This place was not just a nice place to skate and play hockey from October to March. He turned it into a year-round community. <clears throat> Some people might think, me included, he invented roller skating. <laughs> because he turned in the summertime, he turned this into a roller rink. And it wasn't easy in those days because today we have an insulated floor, but in those days we didn't. And after ice being in there for six months, the frost ran pretty deep. And after the ice came out, when the frost started to creep up, the floor was wet. And Earl spent a month to six weeks drying the floor so that we could have roller skating. And then he thought of another way to make a dollar. We had flea markets. We had flea markets. Yep. And then he thought of something. Maybe we should have a community dance. So he hired a band and we turned it into a dance floor. And he made money for the arena. And then other groups caught on to the idea and they rented the building from Earl and one of them was the Lions Club. Again, your founding members of the Lions Club ran dances here. Earl looked after getting you the liquor license. To get the liquor license you had to have food. But Earl did all of those things for you. And I had the good fortune at that time to be a member of the fire department. Hmm. We need to make money. Maybe we should run a dance too, because we need money for fireworks. So, by golly, <coughs> Earl's deal was sell tickets in advance so that I know how many people are coming. 500 is what we're supposed to have. Well, the firemen, pretty popular in town. And when I got the money all collected up on Saturday morning, we had money for 800 people. <laughs> Earl, we've got a problem. What's that? We've got, uh, we're going to have about 800 people. What? I said, we're going to have about 800 people. We don't have enough chairs and tables. That's why I'm telling you, Earl, we've got a problem. <laughs> and Earl got a hold of the boys in Burford, <clears throat> and we rounded up some more tables and chairs. And it's great to see the, the Burford gang here this morning, BJ and, and a couple of his assistants. Thanks for coming, BJ. But we got more tables and chairs, and we fitted everybody in here. The band that night was the Sherwood Trio, and I'll never forget it. It was capacity beyond capacity. And then Earl got thinking, the kids are taking their skates into Brantford to get sharpened. I can be doing that right here. And he taught himself not only how to make ice, and he was self-taught. There's courses today. I mean, our staff today, they're taking courses on how to make ice. Earl Gockel taught himself how to do it. And as Diane Cooper will attest, this building had the reputation of the best ice in Southern Ontario. And it was made by Earl Gockel, not a book, not a university. It was made by Earl. And then he brought along a little boy named Ken, 
who had been sick, but Earl grew him, brought him along, taught him how to work. You go down and you see the two benches that are there in the memory of both Ken and Earl. And Ken's motto was work, be humble, and be kind. And he was the epitome of humble and kind. Because when we decided, we being the council and our arena manager, <clears throat> that we needed an addition, <clears throat> I was very fortunate to chair that committee. And working with Ken was incredible. It wasn't that we need this. I would like to have, I would like to have. I think this can work, John. And we got it a, a, an engineering firm called Group 8. And the head of Group 8 is a local St. George person, Dave Thompson. And he was just a pleasure to work with. And I'm looking out in the crowd and I'm seeing a face when we talk about sharpening skates. I think he taught Andre Legier how to sharpen. And now Andre has the reputation in Southern Ontario of being the best skate sharpener anywhere. Andre, stand up, stand up and take a bow. He's shy, he's shy. But I'm in this building a lot. I love this place. I'm here every Friday morning at 10 because the boys have break at 10 and I have break with them on Friday mornings. And I've seen people come in to get their skate sharpened and they're asking for Andre who was taught by Earl. But along came Ken and he was the epitome of quiet, shy class. You don't see graffiti in this building. You saw graffiti once on the skate park out there, once. And Ken closed the gate for two weeks and just calmly told the children, that's enough. And when you learn how to behave, I'll reopen the skate facility, skate, skateboard facility. That's the respect that the youth of this community had for Ken and Earl. I love coming here daily right after Labor Day weekend to watch the ice get put in. And it just doesn't happen overnight. There's a process, a daily process. And a year ago, boys at this community center decided we're gonna honor Ken and before you leave this room, I want you to open one of the curtains and look down on the ice surface. And there's the initials KG, because that's Ken Gockel. And that's what the staff here that worked under Ken thought of him. And you know what? It's back in there again today in honor of Ken and the Gockel family, and it gives me, it's really an honor to speak here. And then when we, we made this addition, again, the Lions Club stepped forward. Because they were in a little room down on Main Street. And they kicked in $320,000 to this building for this addition. This upstairs room ended at those pillars. The other side of those pillars was this room. And the Lions Club again stepped up. And they've moved up here and a look, at, look at their display cases. And I gotta take a minute and thank the Lions Club for what they have contributed to this community. And it's not just the arena, and the, the, but Earl and then Ken. Look at the ballparks that we have now. Look at the tennis court that we have. Look at the splash pad that we have. Look at the three playgrounds that we have, not just here, but up at Sunny Hill and down at King William. And our people, taught by Earl, taught by Ken, maintain that. And one of the things about being in politics, even though it's municipal, your staff 
make me and David Bailey and, and John McAlpine look good. Because I, my phone doesn't ring to complain about the condition of our facilities. They complain about their taxes and they complain about snow plowing, yeah. But they don't complain about the condition of our parks and our buildings here. And it's because of our people taught by Earl Gockel, who taught Ken, who's related on to, we have, to what we have working for us today. I, the Gockel family, starting with Earl, they're iconic. I can't think of a better word, but they're iconic. And if there's anyone else, like Andre, who's a quiet, shy guy, and Diane Cooper is at the back, but they probably got Ken Earl Gockel's stories. And I know Lobie probably has them too. But uh, I can remember, Mark, when you were nothing but trouble, and Earl took you under his wing. He said, I'm going to hire that kid. And look at him today, low plumbing and heating. And Dean Morrison was another one. And Jimmy Roseburg was one of the first tractor drivers to clean the ice was Jimmy Rosper. I thank everyone for coming and try and remember the Gockel family. But before you leave this room, I want you to open one of the curtains and look down there because KG is back in the ice because of our staff and the way they think of the Gockels. Thank you so much, Gockel family, for being here and give me something to talk about because it's just like the Nixons and the Gockles put this place on the map. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wheat. He, he, you know what, he's the roughest, gruffest guy, but he has this crazy soft heart for things that he believes in and things that he loves. And he, he, he does love the Gockle family and he, he, uh, he really did want this to happen today and I'm glad that you all Came, came to hear that. And it's funny that I think back now and I think I, I'm looking at these faces, I see all these faces that roller skated with us. The whole roller rink's here tonight, you know that. All of our generation that survived are all here and we were very good at it. We were very good at it. And, uh, but I, I, I think now of, of Earl and I think of Ken. And you know, when you're ever in a place where uh, it's an emergency or things go wrong or you're, uh, they, they teach you not to run. Firemen don't run. They start to walk faster. They, they, they don't run. No one, because running uh, means panic and means out of control. It means frantic. And that's what, that's what I remember about Earl too and Ken. They, they didn't run. They just, if it was important, they'd run, walk a little faster. But no one, no one ever felt chaos or, or confusion uh, when, when the Gockles were in control of this building. And I, I do remember that, and then now that I think of the training of the fire people, that's what they teach them, is never, never show anything that looks frantic, and it was never frantic here. So with that being said, I'm going to call on, I think, Councillor McAlpine, you have something to say? Come on up. So I don't have a lot extra to add to what's already been said, because it's um, such a shining example of an individual that's quiet and has worked steady to improve our community. And I was one of those individuals that benefited from it. I remember roller skating in the summer and skating in the winter and coming here for dances and the fundraisers and the paper drives and uh, it was an amazing time. You know, I'd always tell people I picked really great parents so that lived in this community. So, um, and I think it's important today to set that shining example, that name Gockel on the top there and then on the rink and to remember those people and show them to the community of examples of what we should strive to be in our service to the community. And I appreciate all the work that everybody has done as well as Alliance, my dad being Alliant over the years and helping and working at this. And, uh, and that's an example of stewardship that I inherited as a counselor that I would like to continue. And I can echo what John said, I never got a call once in the last four years of a problem here. And so that those things make our lives so much easier. And so that's all I'm going to say that hasn't already been said. So thanks for everybody that came out to celebrate this today. Uh, so before we hear from uh, from Kate uh, Gockel, um, I, I'd just like to say again that um, the, the incentives that were taken by, by Earl and by Ken 
when they open this arena up as dance halls or barbecues or anything that they did, it brought the community together. We, we wouldn't, back then, uh, the people in the, in the town of St. George were, were different from the people that lived on the side roads. And I remember these dances bringing people in from all the side roads. So you got to meet the people that were on German School Road and Scenic Drive and all those places because they would hear. And back then there wasn't a lot of things to do. Uh, so when they heard there was a dance at the arena, it meant everybody was coming to the dance at the arena. So that's how a lot of us met people that didn't go to St. George School or something. They might have gone to Branchton School or they might have gone to a private school. You, you don't know where they went, but you didn't know them. So when, when we used to get notices that there was a dance at the arena, we, it, it really was something that opened the community of St. George up to new people. And although they didn't live miles away, we had no reason to know them unless they came. And that's how we met a lot of people. So, so th there's a lot of, um, lot of trickle-down effect as to, to what's happened with the programming at this, at this place. And I'm, su I'm sure that Earl didn't think of them all himself, but Earl had to okay them all because he was responsible for the wear and tear on this building, so he couldn't sort of rent it out to a bunch of monkeys and then be responsible to the county, or back then South Dumfries, to, to fix the repairs and things like that. So his judgment did matter, even if it wasn't his idea. He had to maintain the decorum of this, of this building. So um, not that he thought of everything maybe, but he certainly had to okay the final results or it wouldn't have happened. With that, I'm gonna call on Kate Gockel to come up and speak on behalf of her Oh, the family. As we've just heard from John um, and David, that it, it's, it is a testament to our father and uh, our brother and everything that they've done. I, I, I'll just follow up for a few comments. I, I also appreciate that you mentioned our mom uh, because uh, not only did she work in the booth, but she, she worked in the office with dad as well. Um, doing some of the books and uh, they were a team together and I can remember asking dad um, about what, what you know what were mom's happiest times and he said you know she really liked working in the arena and and we worked well together um, and I remember those days too is uh, a time that they worked well together and and they had a common purpose and she was right by his side for organizing all of those activities, um, including the dances. I can remember, and my brother will attest to this, uh, making huge bowls of potato salad and coleslaw. And um, in a shelf in the basement of the house that we had, you know, the big Pyrex bowls. I think Mary's got them at her house now. And those were for those dances, like huge big bowls of food um, and that's what everybody did they just all worked together so I just wanted to mention that about mom also uh, our sister Pat um, who wrote those letters so I, you know I didn't know that <laughs> um, she sent her best wishes and wished that she could have been here today for those of you that don't know Pat lives in Phoenix Arizona now and she works uh, manages a hotel for Marriott down there and, and she's been down she was in Texas for a while and she's been in Arizona for hmm, quite a few years now 10 10 years maybe uh, but she sure wished that she could have been here and I'm sure had she been the two of you could have shared some stories about those letters from uh, I was gonna say so long ago maybe I won't say that <laughs> so uh, I want to start now by just saying uh, on behalf of our family uh, thank you so much to the county of Brant, Brant for this gathering and I think as we've already seen it's going to provide us an opportunity to extend the thanks um, and just to acknowledge the effort in making this day a reality and it's it's going to give us a chance to visit because we've already done a little bit of that and to remember stories and to smile, but maybe to be a little sad sometimes too. And so we appreciate that you've provided this opportunity for us to do that together today. And John, thank you so much for your speech today. Um, I hope someone has recorded that because uh, there sure were a lot of stories there. 
we really owe you a debt of gratitude for first putting this idea forward um, for this building. And as we've already said, it, it holds so many memories for our family. Um, and Rick and I were saying before we came up here today, upstairs today, that we're pretty sure every one of our family worked here at one time. Rick wasn't sure if we were working all here together at the same time. But I worked in the booth and cleaned toilets and cleaned windows and uh, I know that uh, uh, we all had our turn um, with part-time jobs here. I'm going to mention Al as well. Um, our oldest brother, Al, had he been able to be here, I know this would have been a special day for him as well. Al is in a nursing home in Leamington um, and is doing okay. And uh, I know that Deb and, and Melody and Christy will be taking news back to him and maybe a few pictures to share with him on all of the memories um, here. And he, being the oldest, he, he has the most memories and, and years here. So. Uh, um, we miss him today, too. So, John, going back to you, um, you were always so supportive to Earl and Ken, and I, I remember Mary saying that uh, Ken had said, John always had my back. So you were so, such a support to both of them. Uh, long before uh, renaming this arena, you were always an ear to listen, and you had a helping hand when needed. And so today we're saying we appreciate your, your kindness and your steadfast determination to see this through. And I could see and hear in your voice um, how important that was to you um, and how passionate you were in making this happen. And uh, on behalf of the family, we, we say thank you for that. And we want to thank you too for your service to this community and uh, we wish you luck in the upcoming election. So I, I just want to take a few minutes and talk about service, if we can. So service can be defined as the action of helping or doing work for someone or an act of helpful activity. But a job, on the other hand, is a paid position of regular employment. But for Earl and for Ken, this was never just a job, never just collecting a pay. When the phone would ring at home and that there's a problem reported, so whether it's a cantankerous compressor or a stalled Olympia or the stove wasn't working in the kitchen in the hall or a baseball diamond had a problem, um, I know in the house where I grew up, uh, dad would be out the door and fortunately for us it was just a few blocks away and he went up to try to solve that problem. And for Ken, uh, he would drop what he was doing and drive from where they lived in Brantford and he would say to Mary, it's my job. But really, it was more than just a job. For them both, it was a service. So, as John mentioned, it was service to this community. So being helpful to all those volunteer groups who used all of the facilities, as David mentioned, to the ball diamonds, uh, the community halls, uh, playgrounds. Um, and then all of those volunteer groups who made the programs happen in those facilities, so minor hockey, minor ball, slow pitch, figure skating, the Lions Club, the Women's Institute. All of those volunteer communities work together with Earl and Ken uh, to make those things happen in the community. And then as was already mentioned, uh, service to the staff here, um, being a role model in the care of the building. Uh, as was mentioned, it, it's always had this reputation of best ice and cleanest building around. And today we can see that still carries on. It's a beautiful building. 
so well cared for. They also tried to encourage and mentor staff uh, to seek further training and obviously that's happened. We see that in the staff today that they have gone on, taken more training and uh, have learned to keep this building in the state that it's in today. And even after retirement, Ken still provided assistance, as Mary said. He, if he had a phone call uh, once or twice a week after he retired, just with a couple of questions from the staff who continued to work here, and he was always giving of his time, even in retirement, to help out where he could. And let's talk about service to family. Um, and to their own families, Earl and Ken were commendable examples for us of service. And they were the role models for generations that have followed in, in the form of football, hockey, or baseball coaches, uh, police service, uh, youth group volunteers, service club members, championing fundraising for health causes such as cancer or diabetes, so that service that we saw growing up has carried on in generations, and that's important. So service, it was service and not just a job for our family. So we're going to, I'm just going to uh, close by saying um, our family is so grateful and appreciative for this acknowledgement today. And we're also thankful for the kindness and support shown by ARENA staff who were so helpful in finding ways to remember. And as we said, if we look out onto the ice, we'll see one of those things out there uh, for Ken. And the benches downstairs, well, I think we as a family came up with that idea, but it, ARENA staff were right on board with having those benches in place. And those things will just be another example to people who come to this arena from all around and will say, oh, what is it with this Gockel family and Gockel Arena? And what kind of a name is that anyway, Gockel? <laughs> so that will continue into history. Um, and hopefully uh, people will remember and uh, and know what they were all about. Now Earl, we've heard lots of stories about Earl and as I said, everybody's probably got lots of stories. We were so blessed to have him on this earth for 85 years um, to share his wisdom and his humor. And uh, as I was writing this, I had to put in sometimes his crankiness too. <laughs> but sometimes his crankiness came across because he cared so much about this building and the people who were in it, whether they were staff or whether they were visitors to the building. And Ken, who is taken from us far, far too soon and is so missed every day by, by so many, us as a family and, and so many in the community as well. So our hope is that that example will continue to the staff, to the community and in our own families for generations to come. The sign on this building, this arena, this community center will be a reminder to all of what can be achieved with hard work and dedication and service, not just a job, a service. And I know that somewhere up there, KG and Duke are so very pleased to see us all here today. We celebrate who they were and we salute the County of Brant for this wonderful honor. Thank you very much. So that, that does conclude our program. Uh, what I'm going to ask people to do, the, the, the Gockel family and all the little Gockels from the family, uh, if we could go out front and get a picture taken with all the speakers. So, Councillor Wheat, Councillor McAlpine, and Mr. Balma, if we can go outside and they, they've roped off a little area for us here so we don't stray. 
And uh, so we can go up there now, and then there's refreshments back here after we get our pictures taken. So thank you.